All right, well, let's have a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for bringing us here this evening. We thank you for this week and your blessings and your guidance and providence. And Lord, we ask that we will receive a rich blessing tonight as we wind down our seminar. For those who are on their way, we ask for a safe uh, arrival. And um, Lord, we thank you ahead of time for the blessings. We love you, Jesus, and we know that you're here. So help us to be receptive to your presence and your grace. In your holy name we pray, amen. amen. Okay, so I'm going to ask Bob to bring... Oh, here's the jar right here. That was quick. Okay, so we have a couple, a couple of DVDs, and this is our last raffle. This is our last raffle. Oh, okay. So we still have one more ticket. Okay, let's do this. Okay. Okay, there's that one. I already put the copy in here. No, I ended up with two tickets. Oh, you did? Yeah. Is that just because I'm the uh, <laughs> <laughs> Really? Okay. Well, let's take one of those. Okay. Well, let me see. No, actually, actually, just put this. I don't. I would think the pair is in here. No, 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 no. There's two different, two different numbers. There's two different numbers, yeah. right? Okay. You gave me one, and then the other gentleman gave me one. Yeah. All right. So you got. I didn't know you already had one. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know if I wasn't supposed to get two. I knew, but I have two. The last two numbers are six four. The one you have. They are yes. And this is seven zero. Oh. So let's take out the seven zero. Oh. Okay. See, I didn't know this was part of my pastor description. <laughs> it is. It is doing this. And, well, what do you know? It's the last one. <laughs> so, we're taking the 7 O out of the way. And let's put this back in here. Okay. Okay, so the DVDs is this one is called The Midnight Cry. It's uh, entitled William, William Miller and the End of the World and it's narrated by the actor Cliff Robertson. Yes, remember Cliff Robertson? Uh, in the sound, wasn't he the one in The Sound of Music? Uh, no, no he wasn't. But Cliff Robertson is an actor, a Hollywood actor. And he actually narrates this and it is about where the United States was in the Second Great Awakening in the 1830s and 1840s, and this is talking about the Baptist preacher William Miller. And now he was preaching, uh, you know, the, the second coming of Jesus. And it's very, it's like a docudrama. It's very, very good. Very good. I like this. I need another one. I've already gone through the three. That one oh, okay. <laughs> so, so I got that one. And then this one here, we've given this one out. I, I don't know if we gave this one out yet already. Um, and then this one we've given out, Hell and Mr. Fudge. This is, a, uh, this is a movie, um, and it's about, it's a true story. So this is nonfiction. Pretty good. Uh, yeah, and it's about um, Mr. Edward Fudge. That's his real name. And uh, about his college days and how he was going to do some research into, he was invited to do some research into the topic of hell. And... Uh, he, in his, in his ongoing research, he gets married, in his ongoing research, he discovers some things that sort of rocked his world. And um, he wrote a book about it. Uh, the scholarly version is about this big. It's called The Fire That Consumes. And uh, then he, uh, so he's not Adventist. He's not Seventh-day Adventist. Um, then he wrote another smaller version of the book which I would give along with this, but I have three DVDs and three books in my office. So this is like an extra one. Okay, so these are the two prizes. And uh, I'm gonna ask Diana, we'll do the William, the Midnight Cry one first. So I'm gonna ask you to just grab a ticket and read off the last three numbers. 367. Oh, right here. All right, hey. there you go. Okay, you can just hold on to that. Okay, you didn't put it back, did you? Oh, well, if you pick, oh, so it, it's okay. If you pick 367 again, we know. I know. Really? Yes. Yours is 365. Yeah. 
And mine was 372. Okay, 65, remember that, okay. Yeah, but we have two chances. <laughs> that's true, that's true. He's got, there's, yeah, but he's got two chances. Oh, he's, he you have. count. He just won too many times. <laughs> 367 again. Again? Again? How's, well, how threw, is that? I, I threw it in. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay. All right, good. Well, we got that one out. Okay. Oh, yeah. Like, how to do that again? 364. That's me. All right. Hey, I was hoping. So you got Helen, Mr. Fudge. There you go. <laughs> Congratulations. That's okay. Doesn't matter now. That's okay. All right. So who did not get this book called The Next Superpower by Mark Finley. Who did not get one? Everybody got one. Okay, good. So I just wanted to make sure that. Okay, I have, um, I have two lessons here. Actually, I actually have three of them. <laughs> I couldn't remember. Are we on lesson 22 or 23? 22. 22? Okay, that's what I thought because I have it right here. It's open. Um, we don't have slides for tonight for lesson 22. So we're going to really go by everything that's in here. Um, of course, I have my answers, so we'll share the answers. Okay, this one is entitled, <coughs> Daniel's People Delivered. And uh, this one goes over, this is interesting. In fact, Carlos and I were having a conversation about this. This goes a little bit, not in terrible detail, over the Israel of the Old Testament and compared with the Israel of the New Testament. Um, and then Christ's message to Israel, the, and I already said the Old, the New Testament Israel, the final Israel. And uh, so that's what this lesson goes over. And keep in mind, in uh, Daniel, when we look at these texts, remember Daniel chapter 9, where Daniel gave, uh, the angel is telling Gabriel, um, 70 weeks are cut off or determined for your people. And then things are going to happen at the beginning of that, and then sort of in the middle in the last week, and that was the time period uh, that God had given for uh, his people in, uh, during Daniel's day. Okay, so let's look at the lesson. It says here on the very top, on the inside, page two, conflict after, oh, Brent, I have some lessons so you can, who does not have their lesson here tonight? Okay, everybody has their lesson. I'm going to give you one. You. There you go. We have prayer. Okay, conflict after conflict has occurred throughout the book of Daniel. What happened in ancient Babylon is a foretaste of what will happen to God's people in the time of the end. Especially those, uh, the stories in the first six chapters. So here's what's interesting about Daniel. Chapter 7 through 12 all of those prophecies and what's going to happen? Well, those prophecies are actually illustrated by the stories in the first six chapters. It's interesting. Uh, but those prophecies are long-term prophecies, the apocalyptic prophecies way in the, in the end times. Okay, um, and it says, the good news of the book of Daniel is that God ultimately will win this conflict. Amen? Amen. He will win. He will be the triumphant one and those who choose to be on his side. Okay, so I hope you read uh, we, uh, Daniel chapter 12. In fact, why don't we open up our Bibles? We're going to read a few verses right now. Daniel chapter 12. And if there's time, we're even going to go to the book of Romans later on. Okay, Daniel chapter 12. Okay, so remember in Daniel 11, there's the king of the north, the king of the south, um, there's wars and conflicts going on. It involves uh, God's people. All of this involves God's people to one extent or another. Um, and then verse 45 of chapter 11 says, And he shall plant the tents of his palace between the seas on the glorious holy mountain, yet he shall come to his end, and no one will help him. This is the demise of those powers that God knew about. God is controlling all affairs, but they will come to their end. And chapter 12 and verse 1 says, At that time, Michael shall stand up. Now, when it says at that time, this is a reference to the latter days. All of this prophecy has to do with the, the latter days. At that time, Michael shall stand up, 
the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of what? Anguish. Of anguish, of trouble. Okay. Such as never was since there was a nation even to that time. And at that time your people shall be what? Delivered. Your people will be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book. And no doubt this is the book of life, the Lamb's book of life. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the, of the earth, what will happen to them? They shall awake some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Now, if you think about that, it's almost counterintuitive to say some people are going to resurrect from the dead, but they're going to resurrect for shame and everlasting contempt. So why resurrect them? This is where we connected this passage to, uh, I almost said Romans, to Revelation chapter 20 at that great white throne judgment where the sea shall give up the dead, the graves and Hades shall give up the dead, and the books will be open and all will stand before the great white throne judgment and be judged. Well, that's not a reference to the saints because the saints have already been saved. In fact, they are the ones that are given judgment during that thousand years as, as we learned. And I know that's a lot of information to process, but uh, too bad, you have to remember. <laughs> uh, let's see. And verse 3, those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So it's not only the, those who are on God's side um, that he says will shine, but those who turn many to righteousness like the stars. In other words, it's the God's people, it is their privilege and joy and duty to share with others so that they will also uh, shine like stars. And then verse 4, but you, Daniel, shut up the words and s do what? Seal the, Seal the book. Until when? The end of the Until the time of the end, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. That could be a reference to secular knowledge. It could be a reference to religious knowledge, the knowledge of the prophecies. Um, then I, Daniel, looked, and there stood two others on this river bank and the other on that river bank. And one said to the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, How long shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? Then I heard the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and, on, and his left hand to heaven, and swore by him who lives forever. Who lives forever? Who is this being God. swearing by? Yeah, uh, God, or the Son of Man. The Son of God, uh, so, uh, that it shall be for a time, times, and half a time. We saw this before. That's 1,260 years. That is the period when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered and these things shall be finished. That was the time of um, the dominance of this little horn power. Um, in the early centuries, uh, more specifically the uh, 6th century AD, all the way through the Middle Ages and up to, as we learned, to 1798. Remember I showed you that newspaper? So we're talking about the papacy. Um, and then he says, although I heard, I did not understand. Then I said, my Lord, what shall, the end, what shall be the end of these things? Verse 9, and he said, what did he say to Daniel? Go your way. <laughs> Go your way, Daniel. And I don't think he's saying, you know, get out of here. Mine says, Go now, Daniel. Yeah, go now. It's like saying, Daniel. It's like what Jesus said to the disciples in Acts chapter 1. When will these things be? And Jesus said, It's not for you to know the times and the seasons. But when the Holy Spirit will come on you, you will receive power, etc. There are certain things that even Daniel was not privileged to understand. The angel is saying, go your way. For the words are what? Closed up and sealed when? Until when? Yeah. The Till the time of the end. That is a strong indication that these words are sealed. 
If something is sealed, you can't really look at it, much less understand it. Now, obviously, people had the books and the scrolls of, of the book of Daniel. But as far as the discernment and what do these things mean, the angel is telling Gabriel, uh, Daniel, go your way. All this information is sealed up until the time of the end. By the way, in Bible speak, in Bible language, with the first coming of Jesus to Bethlehem and his ministry, until now, this is actually considered the times of the end of, the, of world history. Now, I know it's 2,000 years, so that sounds like a paradox. You know what? You know, times of the end should be five years or my generation, you know, 40 years or, or, or something. But actually, in Scripture, if you read Scripture uh, closely, the New Testament, the times of the end, not the end of time. That's a little bit different. The end of time is, that's it. But the times of the end period is actually from the first century until, until our day. Let's look at the questions. We'll stop there. Question number one. It's okay. Question number one. What three things happen concerning God's people at the time of the end? There's three things that happen. Number one says, at that time shall, who shall stand up? Michael. So at the time of the end, Michael himself will stand up. Plus, number two, there shall be a time of trouble or stress. You know, we're all stressed out. Uh, double trouble. There's going to be a time of trouble. Um, and number three says, thy people shall be delivered. Now, you know, perhaps some people will read that and say, um, you see, the, God's people will not go through that time of trouble because they'll be delivered. I suppose one could say, then why didn't the angel say, but the people will not go through that time of trouble? Um, as you see in the book of Daniel itself, God's people go through times of trouble, through all of that stress. Um, this is what bolsters our faith when we have those, uh, uh, you know, those stress points placed on our faith, on our trust in God. And life has a way of doing that. It's going to stress and stretch and push and play tricks on your mind. This is what helps us to develop perseverance. Um, but we will be rescued. We're not going to be at the whims and at the mercy of all of, uh, of these. God's people will be delivered we'll, as long as we're faithful. Now look at the note. The promise to Daniel's people. The message of assurance was addressed to Daniel. His people would be the Jewish people. Since Daniel was a Jew, of course, does this mean that only Jewish people will be delivered in the final conflict? Is Daniel 12.1 talking about the Israelites living in the Middle East, New York, or anywhere else? To whom does the term Israel, Daniel's people, apply in the last days? In order to fathom fully the meaning of this prophecy, we need to carefully examine the term Israel as it appears throughout Scripture. In our search, we will discover that the term Israel changes meaning dependent upon who the people of God are at that particular time. The term Israel is the covenant name for the people of God. And as I said earlier uh, tonight, we're going to look at some uh, verses in Romans. I was kicking myself earlier because I have all these sticky notes and notes in my personal study Bible that I usually don't bring at church. And I have all of this stuff written. I forgot to bring it. So I'm going to try and rely on memory and look at the book of Romans and I'll share, I'll share some verses. But let's go to uh, look at Israel in the Old Testament. Question number two. <clears throat> what two things did God promise Abraham when he called him out of the land of Ur? Now this is according to Genesis 13 verses 14 through 16. There's two things that God promised him. Number one was land. Number one was land. He did promise him some real estate. <clears throat> and then also he promised him seed. He promised him a child. God specifically said, from your own body. Well, later he said that. From your own body. I don't know why God didn't say that the first time around. Uh, no, I think he did say that from the first time around. Yeah. Not with descendants of many of the stars, numerous of the stars. Well, that's true. That's true. Many nations came from, from Abraham. <clears throat> okay. 
But if we read Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16, which I am going to do in the Bible here, in the Pew Bible, Galatians chapter 3 verse 16 says this, now to Abraham and his seed, singular, were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed who is Christ. This is what Paul says. And this I say that the law, which was 430 years later, cannot annul the covenant, etc., etc. <clears throat> so according to the question, I just read the verse, who is the seed promised to Abraham in Paul's theology. It's Christ. It's Jesus Christ. He specifically says that. It's Christ himself. And then, if you go to Hebrews 11 verses 10 through 16, um, this is the Hall of Faith chapter. The Hall of Faith chapter. And, um, in fact, Hebrews uh, chapter 9. In fact, you know what? Let's read the last verse of chapter 9. This is a bonus verse. You can leave a tip for me at the exit. Okay. <clears throat> oh, no, no, no. It is the last verse of chapter 11. I'm sorry. I'm wrong. Okay. Look at verse 39. Chapter 11, verse 39. This is the verse I want to insert here. Hebrews 11, 39. And all these, he talked about Samson. He talked about David. He talked about Abraham. He talked about Noah. All of these heroes of the faith and all these having obtained a good testimony through faith which they did did not receive the promise did not receive the promise God having provided something better for us so this is the author talking in present tense when he's writing this God having provided something better for us that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Now, I always use this verse <clears throat> when we eventually talk about what happens when people die. Because according to this verse, we will all be made perfect at the same time. That's why when Christ comes back, the dead in Christ will be raised first, then we which are alive. And this is where Paul says to the Corinthians in, in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, and we'll all be changed in the what? The twinkling of an eye. The twinkling of an eye will, will all be changed. <clears throat> and I'll be able to bench press 2,000 pounds. <laughs> no. Okay, now let's go to the verse that the, the, let's go to verses 10 and 16 of Hebrews, chapter 11. Verse 10 says, uh, but, well, verse 9, by faith, this is talking about Abraham, by faith he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. So, of course, Abraham obeyed and he came to the land of Canaan. First, you know, he went northern route. Then he stopped at Terah. Uh, he stopped at Haran where his father Terah died. And then they finally came down and God had to remind him, hey, I want you to go to Canaan. Otherwise, it would have stayed camping in Haran. <laughs> so they came down and Abraham obeyed God. But Abraham never actually took over Canaan. Never did. He looked for something better. Look at verse 16. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to call, be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. So verse 10, it says that Abraham waited for the city, which uh, the builder and maker is God. So in your lesson, you should write the word heavenly. Now they desire a better country, that is heavenly. Notice that the promises made to Abraham of land and seed were very, they were very special promises. They did not refer just to having many descendants and to inheriting the earthly Canaan. These promises, the ultimate, the broad fulfillment of these promises is a heavenly Canaan, right? Where righteousness dwells. That is the, the broader aspect of this. Um, not all the descendants of Abraham received the promises. Isaac received them, but Ishmael did not. Jacob received them, but Esau did not. Since they were spiritual promises, they could only be given to spiritual people. 
Now that last statement, it's on the top of page 3, is important. Because if you read Romans chapter 2, it's interesting how Paul talks about uh, the births and how God, he says, God will have mercy on whom he'll have mercy. And then he gives the illustration of the patriarchs. Now, if you are the firstborn, you should get the inheritance, right? But who was Abraham's firstborn? Ishmael. It was Ishmael. Who was the secondborn? Jacob. No. Isaac. Isaac. Isaac it was Isaac. Who got the promise? Says it was Isaac, the secondborn. That shouldn't have been done. He deceived them. Because that was with who was the who were the sons of Isaac? Um, uh, Jacob. Jacob. And Esau, who was the firstborn? Well, who's the one that came out first? Because they were twins. Esau came out first, and Jacob came out second. Well, who received the promises? Why didn't the firstborn get the promise? And then, and then, when Jacob had his 13 children, one of them was a girl, Dinah, who received the promises? Was it uh, Reuben, the firstborn? Who got them? Oh, come on, you know this. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Oh, please. Who's the one that was sold as a slave? Joseph. And the dreams. Joseph. <laughs> Joseph. <laughs> it was Joseph. He was the chosen one. He was the little guy. Uh, these punk little kid brothers are just, they're all so spoiled, aren't they? <laughs> what was that? That's right. Cain was the older. And he's the... Uh, and. <laughs> Right, I know. And God flips that on its head. He flips it completely upside down. That's why Paul says in Romans 2, God will have mercy on whom he'll have mercy. It is not dependent on birth order. And then Paul develops that thought a lot more in the book of Romans. So this is just a little teaser. Let's go to number five. What was to be Jacob's new name after he had wrestled with the angel? You know this one. It's an easy one. Israel, okay? This is the first time Israel appears in Scripture. It means one who has prevailed against God. Wouldn't you like to be called Israel? Yes. When it's, you know, that wrestling that night and, you know, Jacob got God in a headlock and in a Nelson. Yep. And God said, mercy, mercy, okay, you win. <laughs> okay, okay, I'm tapping the floor. And of course, that's not the way it happened. But in a figurative sense, Jacob wrestling with God did not give up. He said, God, you have to have mercy on me. I know this is the way you are. Please have mercy on me. And he insisted, insisted. Okay, okay. And I think God likes that. I, I really think that, yeah, he just, the angel, just, the angel, angel of the Lord just touched his hip socket and he had a limb for the rest of his life. <laughs> but I, I, God likes that. When we cling to him by faith and you got to forgive me, please have mercy on me. I'm going to meet my brother and I'm dead meat. You know, um, it's just, it, it's amazing. Um, it says here, as time progressed, the name Israel became the name for the covenant people of God who are mainly the ethnic descendants of Abraham in the Old Testament. Although Abraham, remember, where did Abraham come from? This is the other interesting thing. He came from Ur. He didn't come from Palestine. He came from the east where the wise guys came from, the wise men, the three wise men of Jesus. He came from the east in the, in the Mesopotamian, Iraq, I, uh, uh, Iran area, from Ur of the Chaldeans. What is God thinking? Why would he choose somebody from over there? Why not choose somebody, you know, in Palestine? Well, that's Canaan. There was a lot of idolatry there, but there was too in Ur. Abraham's own family were idol worshipers. So it's interesting how God's just going to choose whom he wants. He's going to choose whom he wants. Of course, based on the kind of person they are. God doesn't care. I mean, if, when Jesus was born, nobody was celebrating and blowing shofar horns and, and all of this stuff when Jesus was born in the temple. So God says, hey, I'll, I always have somebody. And so he chose people over in Abraham's area. And they came over and they celebrated Christ's birth when he was a little boy. They went to his home. Okay, uh, uh, it says here, 
The people who came out of Egypt under Moses were called the Israelites when they entered into covenant with God at Mount Sinai, and they became the covenant people. Under David and Solomon, they became a mighty nation. And of course, even before, under Joshua, they just rampaged and conquered all the, not all the peoples, but a lot, most of them in Canaan. Uh, they became a mighty nation. As long as they were faithful to God, the term Israel applied to them. Later, however, the ten northern tribes seceded from the United Kingdom and took the name Israel, but became unfaithful to God. God, God then calls them a harlot because they professed to be Israelites, but they were not. The southern kingdom, um, which was called Judah, as long as they were faithful, they too could be called Israelites. As we will see even more clearly in the New Testament, the term Israel refers to the faithful covenant people of God, whoever and wherever they might be. So after Solomon, Solomon's son, Rehoboam, um, remember that famous saying, my pinky is thicker than my father's waist. If you thought King Solomon was harsh to you, just wait and see. And that's when the nations, that's when the country split. The ten tribes of the north, they said, everybody to your own tents. And that's when the kingdom split. So you had Israel to the north with Samaria as the capital, and you had Judah to the south with Jerusalem as, as its capital. Yeah, it, it, was, it, was, uh, it was kind of a disastrous thing. And Anyway, number six. Name two individuals who are not children of Abraham, who became Israelites and even progenitors of the promised seed Christ. <laughs> it's such an incredible statement. According to Joshua and Ruth and Matthew, Matthew 1, the genealogy of Jesus, the first person was who? Rahab. Yeah, Rahab and the other one? Ruth. Yeah, there was those two individuals, Ruth and Rahab. Um, they were not strictly ethnic descendants. Uh, I mean, Rahab, she was, uh, I don't know how you say it, Jerichoan or Jerichoan, whatever. You know, Rahab lived in Jericho, remember? And, and they marched around and... Um, and she lived, actually, the walls had to have been big and thick because she lived inside the wall. But she helped the spies. And Josephus, Josephus, he's a, a Roman Jewish historian. He, he wasn't a Christian. He wasn't a follower of Jesus. But um, he says that the Israelites, and you won't find this in the Bible, the Israelites gave Rahab property in the land, you know, because Jericho was the first land that they had to go through when they just crossed the Jordan River. And, uh, and they respected her, and she became like their adopted fellow Israelite. Did you say an illustration of being grafted in? Yeah, I would say that. There, she was grafted in. Like the language that Paul uses in, in Romans 11. Mm -hmm. She was grafted in. Okay, um, I'm talking too much. Let's go. <laughs> this next section on page three at the bottom, conditional prophecy. If God predicts evil about a nation or people and they repent, will God bring the evil to pass? Or if God predicts good about a nation and they refuse to obey him, will God bring the good to pass? What do you guys think? No, God is not going to be mocked. Oh, well... I'm God, and I told you I would prosper you, and I know you're disobeying me, but I said it. I can't go back in my word, baloney. You know how many times in Scripture God changes his mind? You know how many times he does that? Even before all of this, even in the days of Moses. Let them, let me at them, Moses. <laughs> it's kind of like God saying, let me at them. I'm going to destroy them, and I'll make you a great nation. What does Moses say? No. no. You've got to remember you brought them out of Egypt. And if you destroy these people, they're all going to say, oh, God brought them all to the desert only to destroy them because he couldn't fulfill their promise to them with taking them into the promised land. That's why God brought them out. He says, no, God forbid people will say that about you. Have mercy. And what did God do? Changed his mind. He relented. I think actually God many times will say certain things to test us and provoke us. He already knows. And Exactly, the same thing. Same thing. God said with Sodom and Gomorrah. God sends the angels and, okay, we're going to destroy it. And what does Abraham say? No, no, my family's in there. And 
Well, what if there's 50 good people in there? What if there's 50 good people? Okay, I won't destroy it for 50. And Abraham says, oh, please don't be mad at me. What about 45? <laughs> he goes all the way down to 10. All the way down to 10. There weren't even 10. You know, it's, it's mercy. God is so merciful. And you see in Scripture, often God will say something and he'll quote, I mean, I'm quoting, you know, I'm doing this, go back on his word. But this is conditional prophecy we're talking about. We're not talking about apocalyptic prophecy here. Yes, Brent. Well, I was just wondering why Abraham didn't keep going after 10. <laughs> I know. Gave up the, the, I, I think Abraham thought, I'm pushing it too much. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just pushing. I better stop here. He still got his nephew off. <laughs> uh, I, I better stop here. Yeah, that's right. So, anyways, um, the answer is no. Look at on the top of page 4. Um, and I mentioned this, there's two types of prophecy. There's, um, I've always said in this seminar, there's classical prophecy and there's apocalyptic prophecy. And there's certain characteristics of the two that are not necessarily uh, coherent with each other. So in classical prophecy, in classical prophecy, it usually has to do, when the prophets do classical prophecy, they're prophesying to something that has to do with their culture and their time and their setting. That's classical prophecy. And also, there are instructions that are designed to teach the people and to help them repent and change their ways in their, in their lifetimes. And God will act in their day accordingly based upon their choices. So God may say, I'm going to destroy Nineveh in 40 days. I want you to go warn the people. Well, was God lying? Did God not know what the people were going to do? I mean, did God not know ahead of time that the people are going to repent? Uh, you know, I mean, go figure. Of course he knew. But God says, go tell him, Jonah. I believe, <laughs> I believe, and a very important part of the story in Jonah is that God was saving Jonah just as much as he was saving the Ninevites. But anyway, and then God relented. So in, yeah. so in classical prophecy, often you'll see this flexibility, um, organic relationship between God and the people, and things may change and things. That's classical prophecy. In apocalyptic prophecy, and I've said this before, you have all of the scary symbols of horns and beasts and multi-headed beasts. The thing with classical prophecy is that the prophets will say, and things might be, might turn out a certain way. They might turn out a certain way based if the people are listening to the prophet in classical prophecy. In apocalyptic prophecy, it's not what might be, this is going to be this way. The second coming of Christ is not classical prophecy. It's going to happen. The little horn power and, and, and going against God's people and persecution and is symbolized by the horn um, and, and all these things, that's not conditional. It is going to happen. So there's some distinctions between these two and it's important to remember those two. You can't mix them up. You can't mix them up. Okay. So um, I want to, um, I'm going to give you some extra bonus points. Again, you can leave me a tip at the door. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 12. 1 Samuel, I'll tell you the page number. I've got my Bible. Verses 19 through 25. Okay, in the Pew Bible, it's page 267. 267 in your Pew Bible. So here are some conditional statements. 1 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 19. 1 Samuel 12, 19. It says, And all the people said to Samuel, Pray for your servants to the Lord your God, that we may not die, for we have added to all our sins the evil of asking a king for ourselves. Then Samuel said to the people, Don't fear, you have done all this wickedness, yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart, and do not turn aside. For then you would go after empty things which cannot profit or deliver, for they are nothing. For the Lord will not forsake his people 
for his great name's sake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you his people. Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you, but I will teach you the good and the right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart, for consider what great things he has done for you. But if you still do wickedly, what does it say? You will be swept away, both you and your king. Well, back in verse 22, it said, For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake. Well, if you just take that out of the context, God will never forsake his people for his great name's sake. But then in verse 25, flips, it, it, he adds more information. But if you do wicked, how does it say? You will be swept away, both you and your king. So you have to remember context, and this is conditional. This is, what is this, apocalyptic classical. prophecy or classical? classical? It's classical prophecy. Go to 1 Kings chapter 2. 1 Kings chapter 2. And in the Pew Bible, that is page 320. Page 320. Um, actually, no, 319. Page 319. 1 Kings chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. <clears throat> uh, okay, so David is talking to King Solomon uh, when David is on his deathbed. And so you know, son, always pray. Be good to your neighbors. Be good to your mom. You know, the last words. Look at verses, uh, what did I say? 3 and 4. And keep the, this is David talking to his son, and keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his judgments, and his testimonies, as it, as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn, that the Lord may fulfill his word which he spoke concerning me, saying, if your sons take heed to their way, to walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul, he said, you shall not lack the man on the throne of Israel. You'll never lack a man on the throne of Israel. Now, is that a blank check promise, yes or no? You will never, if I just say that sentence, you'll never lack a man on your throne. What did God just say a few words before? If your sons don't turn away, then you will never lack a man on the throne. That's a condition. I have a couple more, but uh, if you want to write it down for the interest of time, 1 Kings chapter 9, verses 3 through 9. 1 Kings, I'm not going to look it up, just write it. 1 Kings 9, verses 3 through 9. And I'll give you one more because I have like six of them here. 2 Chronicles 36, 14 through 21. 2 Chronicles 36, 14 through 21. Those are some conditional promises. Let's go to number 8 in the lesson. What did God predict would happen to Israel if they were disobedient and under what conditions would they be able to return to their land? This is Deuteronomy 4, 27 through 30. We won't look it up. I'll just give you the answers. The Lord shall scatter. So write scatter in the blank. The Lord shall scatter you among the nations. The Lord shall scatter you among the nations. Can you guys can you? Can you go back and give it to my son and her? Um, thou shalt seek the Lord thy God. Write the word seek. Thou shalt seek the Lord thy God. If thou turn to the Lord thy God and shalt be obedient unto his voice. Note the condition stated for their return. If they sought the Lord and were obedient, obedient to him, that they would return to the land. As a result of their apostasy, the Israelites were taken into Babylonian captivity. Of course, Daniel lived at that time and knew it was the sins of his people that had caused this calamity. That's why in Daniel chapter 9, for the first, what is it, 19 verses or something, uh, or 23, 23 verses, first 23 verses, it's all prayer. Now, it's, there's no particular sin or sins recorded that Daniel committed in the book of Daniel. Um, so it doesn't mean that he was sinless because Daniel's confession of himself connecting himself with the Israelites proves that Daniel had a healthy self-image of himself. He didn't think he was all that, even though everybody else thought so, right? In fact, even heaven thought so. Daniel, you are a man highly esteemed. 
That's pretty cool. Yeah, That's is. pretty cool. <laughs> but Daniel is humble enough, and he, it's, it's a lot of confession of his, of his own sins. Um, let's go to number nine. Jeremiah had predicted the Babylonian captivity. Does Jeremiah also give a prediction about their return to the land of Palestine? Yes, he does. Jeremiah chapter 30, verses 3 and 11. The Bible says, and this is your lesson, I will cause them to return to the land. I will cause them. Who doesn't have a lesson? I think some walked in late. I forgot about these guys. <laughs> there's, one, there's two of them. Uh, sorry about that. So Jeremiah not only, not only foresaw the 70 years of captivity in Babylon, he also predicted that a great company of Jews would return to the land of Palestine when that captivity was over. Let's look at this verse, Jeremiah 31, verses 8 and 9. Jeremiah 31, verses 8 and 9. And that is going to be on page 763. In verse 7 it says, For thus says the Lord, so we know God is talking. Verses 8 and 9, Behold, I will bring them from the north country and gather them from the ends of the earth. Among them, the blind and the lame, the woman with child and the one who labors with child together, a great throng shall return there. They shall come with weeping and with supplications I will lead them. I will cause them to walk by the rivers of water in a straight way in which they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel and Ephraim is uh, my firstborn. Okay, and look at 31 verse 1. I will be the God of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people. Um, unfortunately, they didn't really pay much heed to Jeremiah's warnings, which is why they went to Babylon. That's why Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet. Number 10, when the Jews returned from Babylonian captivity, how much time did God give them? 70 weeks, which how many years is that in apocalyptic prophecy? How many years? 490. 490. Okay. Um, so this is uh, the time that the Jews were given to make things fully right as God's covenant people. When God allowed the Jews to return from the Babylonian captivity, who was, what was the name of the Persian king that told the Jews, you guys can go back to your land? Cyrus, yes, it was Cyrus. Um, you know, it's interesting, I've said this before. Uh, my family, we went to the Persian Room. Persian Room, yeah. It's a restaurant in Scottsdale. You've been to the Persian Room? It's, it's a great place. It's a great place. And they, have a, they even have a, um, a restaurant there. Run, right, out, right there. There's not a restaurant, a store. Like a little grocery store, and they sell... Persian things and uh, foods. I mean, foods. What was that? Oh, <laughs> Shaban ice cream. Baklava and spices and things you won't see in other stores. Anyways, um, years ago, my son, my wife and I, and I don't remember who we were with, we went to eat the Persian room. And on the wall, there's this beautiful portrait of a king arrayed and just, I mean, just amazing. Yeah. And... Uh, <laughs> And so they're Persian, you know, uh, Iranians, but don't say Iranians, call them, they like to be called Persians. And I said, uh, who, who is that? And the, the hostess says, oh, that's King Cyrus. I said, oh, that's a nice picture. <laughs> I told her, I said, you know, King Cyrus really liked the Jews. He was very favorable to the Jewish people. She just kind of looked at me like, what? <laughs> <laughs> that was, I don't know if you remember that, Ray. But that, was, that was kind of funny. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yep. Anyway, um, at the end of the 490 years, they rejected the Messiah, crucified him. Now, not everybody, of course, because some, even some of the priests came to believe in Christ. And Jews came to believe in Christ, obviously. Um, uh, they began a systematic persecution of his followers by stoning Stephen in 34 AD. The nation that once had been the honored depository of the truth of God now had killed the Son of God. Therefore, the spiritual term Israel could no longer be applied to them. They were no longer overcomers. 
Now the next section says Christ's message to Israel. This is the emergence of a spiritual new Israel. Look at number 11. The fig tree was a symbol of the nation of Israel according to Isaiah 5 verses 1 through 7. What did Jesus say would happen to the fig tree if it did not bear fruit? Thou shalt cut it down. This is what Jesus said. Okay? It will be cut down. Number 12. Why was Jesus unable to gather Israel to himself? And what was to happen if they refused to be gathered to Christ? This is in Luke 13, verses 34 and 35. And this is Jesus speaking here. And ye would not, you would not, you don't want to be gathered to me. And he says, your house is left unto you what? Desolate. So God's presence would be withdrawn and no longer would have. That's why, you know, when Christ was crucified, that curtain uh, hiding the most holy place was ripped from top to bottom. Now, you know, that wasn't human doing because otherwise it would have been ripped from bottom to top. Um, so it was ripped from top to bottom. Being here mentioning Stephen, can I just throw something in? Sure. I was watching a seminar yesterday and like the first question of our lesson here today, it says Jesus... Uh, Michael stood up, was, stand, was, st was standing up. Right. Well, the thing I watched yesterday said that when they stoned Stephen, which was the end of the timeline, right. right. he was looking up, and as he was dying, he seen Jesus standing up. Right. And they referred to that as when Jesus was standing, that he was judging. Yeah, yeah, and, um, yeah, exactly. Okay, and then, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Number 13, what would happen to ethnic Israel's privilege of being the chosen people, according to Matthew 21? The kingdom of God, again, this is Jesus speaking. The kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruit thereof. The kingdom of God. Uh, this is a stunning announcement, it says in the, in the lesson. The privilege of being God's chosen people would be taken away from the Jews and given to someone else who would produce fruit. Now, let's go to the New Testament Israel. Okay, let me interject something here. Um, and again, Carlos and I were having a really interesting conversation the other day. Um, there's this, uh, they call it theology, that's called replacement theology or supersessionism. Replacement theology or supersessionism. And what that means is that this idea that ethnic literal Israel, literal Jews, ethnic Jews, literal Jews, um, that they are no longer the chosen people of God. The Old Testament promises of them getting the land uh, where they are now um, and all the promises in the Old Testament referring to the Israelites, it has now been replaced by the church. So the New Testament church, the Christian church, has replaced the, uh, the ethnic Jews, the literal Jews. Um, and then one of the major problems that those who are against this idea, one of the major problems they see is that it leads to anti-Semitism. Strong anti-Semitism. In fact, I was reading... I was reading a lot on this the other day. Um, they even go far, so far as to say that it actually influenced, um, had a certain amount of influence upon the Nazis to persecute the Jews. And that it is just, um, it is just fostered hatred and animosity against these Jews. This idea that now ethnic Israel is no longer God's chosen people, but we Christians are, spiritual Israel. That's one of the things. Um, the other problem that they will have with this idea of replacement theology, <coughs> the other problem they have is that um, if you believe in replacement theology, then you're making God out to be a liar. Basically making God out to be a liar. Because God made promises. And if God made promises to the Israelites, then you're making God out to be a liar. The other thing they have a problem with, this is another big one, is then how do you explain May 14, 1948? How do you explain that? 
um, and the events that led up to the Israelites being recognized, not by the entire world. The entire world does not recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Um, but how do you coincide this seemingly miraculous event of Israel being recognized as its own nation in 1948? In fact, Hal Lindsey, um, an evangelical Christian, prophesied that the secret rapture would take place in 1988 exactly 40 years after 1948. And his thinking was, well, because in the Bible, a generation is 40 years. And so now that Israel has come back to their land, well, 40 years from now is 1988. That means that the rapture will take place. And once the rapture takes place, then you have that seven year tribulation where the Jews will be converted and help convert and evangelize the world because now they're back in their land. And this is why evangelical Christians place such heavy, heavy emphasis on the Israelites, literal Jews, coming back to Israel because that will eventually usher in the rapture. In other words, these promises of the Old Testament must be fulfilled, must give Israel their, uh, God will bring the Israelites back to their land and that will start ushering in the end of time. That's why they place so much emphasis on this. And so um, they have a really hard problem with people who believe in replacement theology. Now here's the thing. Um, you don't have to raise your hand on this. Don't raise your hand. But how many of you hate the Jews? <laughs> how, many of you, how many of you really hate the Jews? Um, so if we are going to be termed replacement theologians by their terms, by their terms, then I'm not into replacement theology because I don't believe that the Bible supports the ethnic Jews as a whole still ha having a purpose by God in the apocalyptic end of time sense. I don't believe that. But I can tell you as God is my witness, I don't hate the Jews. I think it was atrocious what the Nazis did. Then we should defend the Jews or anybody else who's going through a holocaustic type of place. It hasn't led me in my heart to, to be hostile and, you know, and hatred towards the Jewish people. So in that sense, I'm not a replacement theologian. The Bible sure makes them out to be bad during uh, you know, the crucifixion of Jesus. Yeah, now, yeah, you know, the, the Jews represented by the priesthood and the religious council, the Sanhedrin, they were all in favor, with the exception of few. Nicodemus was not in favor. But the official religious body of the Jewish people voted to crucify Jesus and even produced false witnesses against Jesus and did, even did a mock fraudulent trial. The Jews do not have trials at night. You don't have trials at night. Um, I have a big book this thick. On a, from written by a lawyer and his perspective on the trial of Jesus Christ from a lawyer's standpoint. It's very interesting. Anyway, I need to go on. Uh, the New Testament Israel, number 14. According to the Apostle Paul, who is the real Jew after the cross? In Romans 2, for he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly. Paul makes it clear that after the cross, the real Jew is no longer an ethnic Jew. It's the one that is circumcised in the what? In the heart. You know, you know what circumcision is. I don't have to explain what circumcision is. But you ever, have you ever asked yourself, why circumcision? Yes. Yeah, that's painful. God told Abraham, oh, by the way, you and all of yours, your men need to be circumcised. I, I mean, Abraham wasn't a baby. <laughs> We ever thought, why circumcision? Why not a tattoo or a pierced earlobe or, you know, a nose ring or, or something? Why? Well, I, I didn't mean to go into this, but it's something very, very intimate and personal, obviously. But in that culture and time, masculine virility and producing kids was a source of pride. It's a source of pride. 
What God is saying is that you're cutting off the flesh. You don't depend on the flesh. You depend on me. You're cutting off your flesh. And there's other things, but I, I don't want to go into it. But it's, it's very interesting. Anyways, number 15. Who are the real children of God in the New Testament? The children of the flesh or the children of the promise? According to Romans 9, verses 6 through 8. The children of the promise are counted for the seed, is what Paul says. And then in Romans 11. How only then can an ethnic Jew become a spiritual Jew according to the New Testament if they abide not still in belief? So in Romans chapter 11, Paul has a very interesting illustration and he uses, um, he uses a tree and branches to illustrate his point. Um, and he says that Paul places heavy emphasis on belief, by the way. <coughs> belief is everything. Belief and faith is everything everything. He points that out in, in the whole book of Romans. It is belief and faith that you're counted as righteous and the son of Abraham and his seed. It's not your ethnicity. There's neither now Jew nor Greek in the sense we may not, we may not be identical. I'm never going to be identical to a Jew or a Greek. But from the standpoint of having faith in Christ and believing in him, we're all the same. We're all the same. God cuts through all of the outward appearances. In that sense, we're all the same. But look at what Paul says. This is really interesting. He says here, um, verse, uh, Romans 11, and look at verse 16. For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. La, la, la. I didn't want to go there. Oh, 17. And if some of the branches were broken off, and you being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them, and with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree, do not boast against the branches. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off that I may graft it in, be grafted in. Well said. Because of unbelief, they were broken off. That's what Paul says. And chapters 9, 10, and 11 are all talking, Paul's going into his, his brethren, the Jewish people. He says, because of unbelief, they were broken off. But he also says later, but if they come to belief, guess what will happen? They'll be grafted in again. They'll be grafted in. So he says, and how much more could they be grafted in belief, being them, the Jews? And you're a Gentile. So don't think you're all of that because you were grafted in because they were broken off. In other words, being a part of the, the nutrition nutritional tree is all based on belief in Jesus Christ. It's based on belief. And anybody can be grafted in. God says, I don't care who you are. But if you become an unbeliever, I'll cut you right off. I'll break you right off. It's a very, very interesting illustration. And so, today, we do not say Jews cannot be saved. You never say that. Anybody can be saved, right? Yes. It doesn't matter what ethnicity you are. Anybody can be saved based on belief in whom? In Jesus Christ. Now, this is what, what personally I have a problem with, with this scenario. If I may draw an invisible timeline. This is the New Testament church era. And then the rapture takes place right here. Pew! The Christian church will go up to heaven. The Christians will go up to heaven. But the Jews remain behind. The, yes, the Jews stay. Because only Christians will go to heaven at the rapture. Remember this. Only Christians. Because the Christians and the Jews are two separate entities. The Christian church is only a parenthesis in God's overall plan. Once the rapture happens and the church is out of the way... Now God can start doing this thing with the Jews. The land will return and they'll be evangelized, etc. And then they'll help evangelize the world. And then the Antichrist will come in the middle of that last seven years. But here's a problem I have. If you are going to... Well, it gets more complicated than this because it gets more complicated. So I don't want to get too much deep into this. But the rapture... And the second coming, according to evangelical Christianity, are two separate events. Okay? But here's the, here's the problem. 
Paul specifically says anybody, whether they're a Jew or not, when they come to belief and faith in Christ, they will be saved. There is no place other than if you apply the Old Testament prophecies in a very literalistic way, an overly literalistic way, there's no place in the New Testament that I read of that says your land will give, given, be given back to you regardless of whether you have faith or not. I haven't read that part yet. I, I'm not the most widely read person, but what I have read, they're not saying the Jews must have come, the Jewish nation must come to have faith in Jesus Christ, then their land will be returned to them. That's not what they say. At least I haven't heard that. And uh, I think that flies in the face of what Paul is saying here. We're going to skip some here. The final Israel, number 19. The 144,000 are said to be sealed and ready for Jesus to come. From whom do the 144,000 come? This is question 19. Of all the tribes of where? The children of Israel. Since this is a reference to the last days, the 144,000 made up of children of all the tribes of Israel must refer not to ethnic Jews because that is an apocalyptic prophecy. The sealing. Don't harm the trees or any green thing until we've sealed them with the seal of God on their foreheads, 144,000. That is very, very last days apocalyptic language. Um, symbolic. Who does 144,000 follow? These are they which follow the Lamb wherever He goes. So these are Christians. I mean, if you follow Christ, then you are a Christian, right? You're a Christian if you follow Christ. Number 21. Where does John see the 144,000 standing? On Mount Zion. So he, here he sees... Uh, spiritual Israelites standing on Mount Zion, the very place that symbolized national Israel, now symbolizes spiritual Israel. Number 22, what events are happening on the earth when the 144,000 are sealed? Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of God, of our God in their foreheads. Number 23, who does Daniel say is delivered in the final time of trouble? According to Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. His people, his people will be delivered. Um, and then number 24, I know I'm going quickly because time is up. What does the dragon seek to do to the remnant people of God? He makes war. So the remnant people are those that are in relation to Jesus, not those that have a certain ethnicity. Anybody who worships Christ. You know, in that sense, Jesus and the devil are one in the same mind in that sense. The devil doesn't care who you are, what race you are, what is your genealogy. He doesn't care who you are. Um, if you claim a special genealogy and a connection to Christ, Satan will say, I don't care. I'm going to tempt you and I have my ways of deceiving you so that you'll be lost. And Satan doesn't care where, what birth you are. Um, and Christ, for that matter, doesn't care what ethnicity you are either. As long as you have uh, uh, faith. Okay. Um, go to the back page. We're finishing up. Number one. Um, Israel is a spiritual term. Number two, the term Israel originally referred to the ethnic descendants of Abraham in the Old Testament. However, even then, non-Jews could become Israelites if they accepted the God of heaven. They were adopted. They were be, they were be true. You ought to read Isaiah 55, by the way. Isaiah 50, yes, 55. God gives the same promises to non-Jews and eunuchs if they keep his Sabbath. Same thing. He says, I'll give them the same name that I'm giving you. Same thing. Number three, all prophecies involving the choices of men and nations are conditional or classical prophecy. Thus, the prophecies of Israel's glorious future were conditional upon obedience. Since they were not obedient, the predictions are not fulfilled through ethnic Israel. It doesn't mean Jews cannot be saved today. That's not what that means. 
Number four, Jesus warned that the privilege of being God's chosen people, the Israel of God, would be taken from the Jews and given to another people that would produce fruit. Jesus said that in his own words. Number five, after the cross, the term Israel refers to people who have accepted Christ, faith. Paul goes over this uh, adamantly. Um, by the way, there's a verse in Romans 11 that says, um, and thus, Paul says this, and thus all Israel will be saved. All Israel will be saved. One of the problems I have by taking that too literal is that never in the history of Scripture, if you take biblical history, never has every single Israelite been saved. Never. God brought the people out of Egypt and then they worshiped the golden calf. What do you think? God said, well, I saved them. They are my people, so I, you know, I'll, I'll just have to wink at this. You know how many people died? Thousands when they worshiped the golden calf. Read Numbers 11, the book of Numbers, when they started complaining and God had fire break out on the edges of the camp. And he lifted up the hedges and snakes and spiders started coming in and biting them. That's why Moses had to make a, a bronze snake on a pole. Many, many ethnic Jews died. Never has God saved every single one based on a very arbitrary, overly literalistic interpretation of, well, God said this, he promised it, and so... So when Paul says, and all Israel will be saved, that's never been like that in the history of the, of the book. But if you read the context, I believe he's referring to believing Jews and believing Gentiles together. They are all termed Israel. Okay, so, and you can read the rest. We're out of time. Any questions or comments? I, questions or comments? <laughs> yes. Because the Jews don't accept Christ, then they have to, uh, Christ comes, when he comes the second time, it's the first time for them, right? So then, they, you know, they would come up with this philosophy or whatever that they need to do something. Everything, uh, everything um, that I was describing about the rapture, you know, the New Testament church is just a parenthetical uh, uh, history and the dealings of God with his people. The church must be taken out of the way. That's why they are raptured to heaven. All of this really comes from um, dispensationalism and their interpretation of the prophecies of Daniel, namely Daniel chapter 9 and, and uh, separating that uh, 70th week cutting it off from the first 69, which in the context, there's really no reason to cut it off and fling it into the far future. Um, but this is dispensationalism because uh, there's different dispensations. There's different uh, dispensations in God's dealing with his covenant people in history. You have the dispensation, right now it's the dispensation of grace, the New Testament church. And uh, and so, according to that philosophy, the, God still has a purpose for the Jews. Some of this, I know, and of course, you know, you know this is on YouTube. So, there's going to be some comments on the bottom of YouTube saying, this guy does not know what he's talking about. You know, there, there will always get criticism and, and you know, support and criticism, always. Um, but dispensationalism is, and slash futurism is the reigning school of interpretation in evangelical Christianity today. Now, those of us who aren't say that they take an, a very uh, unwarranted, very literalistic view of Old Testament promises. Too literalistic. And they'll come back that I'm sure if somebody was like you would say, well then you really don't believe the Bible is inspired. You don't really believe that God keeps his promises. That'll be the comeback line to me. I'll say, I, I believe I do. I do believe in God's promises. But this scenario is dispensationalism. Not everybody agrees with dispensationalism and this, this whole scenario. There's a lot of different views on how the end times are going to work out. 
you know, whether you're an idealist, historicist, futurist, dispensationalist, or preterist. You know, not everybody agrees. Not everybody agrees. I do not agree that um, w with this replacement theology that Jews are completely out of the picture and out of God's grace. That's not true. That's simply not true. No one is. No one is. And whether God in 1948, if this was something from God, I can't say whether it is or whether it isn't. Um, what if God does have a purpose in doing that, but what if his purpose is broader and larger than just focusing on the tiny state of Israel? And still, the Israelite land is still not given all back to them. You have the West Bank, you have the Gaza Strip, right, right? You still have that controversy, so they still don't have all of the land that they had before. And, and so, I mean, does, you know, does 1940 really fulfill a prophecy? There's, there's still a lot of contention. Oh, but Donald Trump moved the capital to Jerusalem. That surely was a prophetic event. I, I just don't agree. Can I say something? You have the last thing because we have to close and we okay. have to pray and close. No, go ahead. Okay, um, I, this has nothing to do with this, but this is something I want everybody else to hear about. There's this YouTuber I follow that does politics and religion and he's very, very reliable. I can't tell you who this because I don't remember. But you blew my mind just now because you said May 14th was when Israel was taken in 1948. Well, May 14th, according to my source, which I haven't studied it yet, the Pope is meeting with a lot of heads of the nations in May, May 14, 2020. So anybody want to, might want to keep an eye okay. on that. They're all supposed to be getting together on May 14. I hope I didn't get my date wrong, but I believe it was May 14. Do, do, was it? Do you know? I, I think it was, I'm pretty sure, it was 90% sure it was May 14. That's I know it was 1948. That I know. So. I brought it to my mind. Cause that's, like, that's the date <laughs> they're all going to meet. Okay, so tomorrow morning... We are going to do lesson 23 and 27. So lesson 23, did, I, did we give away lesson 23? Yes. yes. We did? I have 23. Okay. So lesson 23 is for tomorrow morning. And lesson 27 is the last lesson. And that is for uh, tomorrow afternoon. So if I can ask, uh, I need two people this time.